Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome so much. Welcome so much. What am I saying? Welcome, <laughs> welcome to our macroeconomics open class webinar. Um, you know, today we are. I mean, I, I'm just gonna introduce myself real quick. I'm Yi Cheng, and um, I'm here today with Zachary. Zachary, you wanna? I just Zach, I just Zach. Uh, Zach, Zach, yeah. We come, we come Zach, yeah. Um, we're here to sort of teach you guys a little bit more about macroeconomics, uh. So, so yeah. So, um, without further ado, let's go to the scope of today's lesson, right? So this is the scope. And um, yeah. So first of all, we're gonna just you know, do a quick introduction of ourselves, like our subject combination and why we're doing this. And then afterwards, we want to mix things up a little bit because, okay, if you have attended like our previous webinars, normally what we do is we go through like concepts or, or we focus on perhaps answering uh, questions or like, uh, you know, study tips and stuff like that. But today we want to do a mix of both. So we want to go through some concepts, not everything, because we have had feedback that, you know, it's, it gets kind of dry after a while. And, you know, the easier, easier topics are like, um, you can skip those up. So we decided to do that. And the second part of the lecture or webinar will be on essay questions and how we can tackle them. So you you guys will get to like dive into the minds of um, us, I guess, our minds, and see how we approach these kind of questions and how we tackle them. All right. So without further ado, let's go to uh, introduction. Right. So like my name is Yi Cheng. I'm 19 this year and I'm currently in OCS. I'm serving NS. And, and yeah, so um, I used to be from Hua Chong. I came from, uh, I graduated last year and my subject combination was uh, BCME, bio. Yeah, Zach? Okay, uh, hi, my name is Zach. Uh, I'm from RI. I'm uh, 19 this year and uh, I took BCME. I'm also currently serving NS. Uh, you can't see my face cause uh, having a bad hair day. As you can see, they're all having hair. I still don't have hair. Yeah, that's about it. <laughs> uh, I'm a medic. Uh, I, I didn't go to common school. Uh, I'm a medic. So, right. Yeah. Okay. So that's a little bit about us. If you have any questions, like um, you know, personal questions or anything, y'all can like uh, leave it to the end. There will be a Q and A session at the end, right? So the first part will be on tough concepts, and um, you know, Zach will be going through some of them that you guys sent in uh through the Google Forms. Yeah, Zach. Yeah, okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, we'll start with supply side policies. Uh. Basically, uh, if you've read, okay, if most of your notes should have divided supply side policies into mainly two, uh, most of the time for exams, we'll only look at two, which are market oriented and uh, interventionist policies. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, market oriented uh, supply side policies, right? Uh, they are used to uh, reduce the government intervention in the markets and to help the market to work freely by uh, providing, uh, allowing more free market incentives and uh, to increase the competition and to make sure that uh, resources are allocated efficiently. Yeah. Next slide, please. So uh, within market-oriented supply side policies, right, actually, uh, you can further categorize them into two. Uh, you have policies uh, for market for product markets, and uh, which includes uh, increasing the competition inside the market, and uh, this basically reduces the unit cost of production, and uh, helps to improve the productivity and the uh, quality of resources and uh, production quality in general. So basically, it helps to achieve your mostly your micro your micro objective such as uh, Allocative efficiency, productive efficiency, and your dynamic efficiency. Yeah. Uh, other market oriented supply side policies basically will be used for your labor markets, is to help to improve the flexibility of the markets and to also similarly to improve the quantity and quality of labor so that uh, this will therefore improve your productive capacity and hence your. Uh, AS. Yes. Next slide, please. So uh, now we come to interventionist, poli uh, interventionist policies. Uh, this is to uh, involve, to have a direct government intervention in the market because they feel that uh, the, when the free market, because they feel like the free market actually fails to achieve uh, 
uh, certain macroeconomic outcomes uh, like uh, low unemployment and uh, and to also give like in incentives for education and like R and D for clean energy. Yep. So basically, to you know, uh, provide direct provision or to uh, sponsor your uh, merit goods. Yeah. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay, so basically uh, now we'll go on to the balance of trade. Uh, you're probably wondering what is it? Uh, actually, most of you probably won't, worry, won't wonder. Like, you'll probably know what is it. Okay, your balance of trade, right? Uh, most of you all will uh, confuse it with BOP, uh, get confused between BOT and BOP. So BOT actually refers to your net exports. It's actually your net ex exports uh, to make it simpler for you all. It's uh, how you calculate it is basically uh, the sum of the uh, export revenue minus the sum of your imports expenditure. Yeah. So normally, uh, you guys will actually see it as net X equals to X minus M. That's how uh, most schools actually show it. Uh. But uh, for visualization purposes, uh, you will see it like that now. Yeah, but just remember, if you ever see it in like, your textbook or anything, it will look like net X equals to X minus M. Yeah, okay, next slide, please. Yeah, okay, so this is the one most people get confused with, with is basically between your balance of payment and your balance of trade. So for balance of trade is within your balance of payment. So it's a subset of your balance of payment, if that makes things clearer. So your POP, what is it? It's basically uh, every single economic transaction you have between like let's say Singapore and China and like every other part of the world. Lah. So if you can imagine Singapore's BOP, it's probably quite messy because we do a lot of trade with everyone. Yeah, so basically it's a record of all these transactions. Lah. So for example, uh, you ship out my, uh, semiconductors from Singapore to US and you ship oil back from US to Singapore, something like that. So within your BOP, you actually have uh, two categories, your current account and your capital and financial account. Within your current account, you can actually find your BOT, your net exports also. Yeah. Uh, your capital and financial account deals mainly with uh, capital investments and your, uh, if I'm not wrong, your FDIs also. Yeah. So yeah, basically, as you can see here, your this is a difference between the current account and the capital account. Some questions during the exam will actually test you this, especially for CSQ. So it's good to actually remember a few of these points to differentiate between what your current current account and capital accounts are. So as you can see, your current account, what it contains. Sorry, I can go back one side. Yeah, your current account, what it contains is the payments for all your goods and services. Uh, factor income payments are basically uh, let's say uh, labor payments, all those stuff. Yeah, then uh, actually those two are actually the more important ones you need to know that are within your current account. Uh, capital account on the other hand, you have, uh, yeah, uh, very simply your FDI. Yeah, which is probably the only thing you need to remember from your capital account. Uh. But when you're answering your CSQ, you just need to know what is within each of it which of these two accounts and uh, yeah, just need to know dif the differences between them. Lah. I'm pretty sure your notes should have a good summary about it. Yeah, okay, next slide. Yeah, okay, and, uh, and like what I said just now, lah, your BOT is a subset of your BOP. So your BOT is within your BOP. Don't mix up the two, very important. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, pass the time over to each Cheng now to cover terms of trade. All right, thank you so much, Zach. That was very nicely explained. Right, so I'm going to go through terms of trade. So just um, a precursor, by the way, I forgot to mention this, but these are all the responses and like the topics that you guys sent in. La. So you all sent in, we, we gave you all a Google form. For those of you who don't know, it's on the Discord channel. Um, and basically what happened was uh, you guys sent in your concepts la, that you, you guys wanted us to explain. That way we could sort of make it more streamlined uh, and cater to you guys. So these are just some of the concepts that people find tough. And among those is terms of trade. So 
this one is a bit sticky for us because I'm not too sure if you guys know, but we came from the sort of like COVID A-level batch. And so we had the common last topic. Lah. And in terms of trade falls under the international trade, chapter eight. I'm not too sure if it's chapter eight for you guys, but it's the national in, international economy chapter. And thus we didn't we weren't tested on that. We weren't required to study in a sense. So um this took a bit of research and uh, you know like relearning lah, on our part. So yeah, hopefully, I mean Hopefully it's correct. Lah. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of trade is quite a tricky but interesting concept. Right. So um, in economic terms, what it means is that uh, in terms of trade is the rate at which one unit of a good can be exchanged for another. So this rate doesn't mean like the physics rate that you guys know, like not rate of change, none of that. It's basically like a system, like, like an agreement in a sense. So an example I can give that would illustrate terms of trade will be for instance, if I'm I'm like a baker and I make bread, right? And you are someone who wants to uh, make a trade with me. So you you manufacture, for instance, textiles, right? And I want to take your textiles and you want my, my bread. So we come up with an agreement between the two of us that says like, okay, so I will give you two pieces of bread or two croissants, for instance, for one textile. Then that will be the term of terms of terms of trade, lah. Yeah, that will be like the agreement between us. So that's basically what it means. Is um the agreement between two parties. Usually in this case, we're talking about countries, lah, uh, of where like two two goods can be exchanged for for one another, right? So the formula you see here, terms of trade equals to index of average export prices over index of average import prices times hundred. First of all, it's not necessary in your syllabus. Uh, in H2, we don't we don't require anyone to calculate this lah. Um, it's just for like you uh, for knowledge for your knowledge, I guess. If you guys want to dive deeper into like the con quantitative sides of economics, that will be how you calculate terms of trade. Um, but then again, once once again, I want to emphasize that this is not necessary. So don't feel alarmed if you've never seen this before, because frankly speaking, before this week where we were preparing for this like webinar, I haven't seen this before either. So you know, you're safe, you're fine, right? So I think it's all a little bit. Muff, like how do I say, a bit like um, fuzzy for you guys. Like you don't really know what it really means. So I'll illustrate it with an example later, right? So, um, how this terms of trade concept applies for you guys, right? In your essay writing, will be when we're talking about comparative advantage. So, um, normally we use the concept of terms terms of trade when we're talking about how trade can be mutually beneficial for two parties, right? So, trade between two two countries will only be beneficial to each other if the terms of trade lies within the opportunity cost ratios of two trading partners. So this sounds very complex. For you all, if you don't understand this, it's okay. I'll illustrate with an example. But what it means in layman, term, layman terms is that um, if you want the trade between two countries to benefit both parties, it must, um, you must sort of, it must be more, how, how, how do I phrase this? The trade must cause the country um, both countries, both sides, to gain more than they give in terms of opportunity cost, right? So let me illustrate that. Okay, one sec. Right, so I got this table here from um, the Hua Chong Economics Unit notes. And so basically, I'm going to go through this, right? So let's just say there's a developed country, DC over here, and a less developed country, and they are both trying to sort of um, engage in a trade, right? So Intuitively, you know that these two countries, they probably specialize in different things, right? They probably have different sort of assets, different, um, uh, you know, types of labor, different types of land and like capital and stuff like that. So they can engage in different types of um, services and goods productions, right? So um, for instance, let's just assume that the developed country, uh, okay, so let's just, let's just talk about specialization for a moment, right? Specialization is when a country um, sort of devote some of their resources, invest some money, capital, and time into devoting resources into creating a certain type of good. So basically what this, what this table shows is a hypothetical example illustrating how comparative advantage in terms of trade can help the entire world and different countries sort of get more than they can produce on their own, all right? So let's just say, let's just look at here, right? So let's just say there's no specialization in trade, no specialization in trade at all, right? And this is the productive, capacity of these two countries, right? So the developed country can manufacture 20 textiles and 30 cars, correct? So um, that's what they manufacture, right? They are, they are more developed than a less developed country, so naturally they can make more. Whereas the less developed country, LDC here, uh, will produce 15 textiles and 10 cars, okay? So this will come up to an overall total of 35 
and 35 textiles and 40 cars. Those are all units, like arbitrary units uh, in the world. So the reason why we're calculating the total in the world, right, is to show that because of trade and comparative advantage, you can get a net increase in the total amount of goods produced in the world, right? So using this number over here, textiles and cars and here over here, we can formulate um, the opportunity cost ratio of producing one unit of each, uh, both the textiles and the cars. So opportunity cost, I don't know if you guys remember, but just a recap, opportunity cost is the cost of the next best alternative foregone by a certain decision. So for instance, if let's say I was to illustrate this, um, let's just say I have uh, $2, right? And I have a choice of buying perhaps an ice cream, a chocolate ice cream, or um, buying, I don't know, a, a wallet or something, right? So if I choose to buy the ice cream because I think it brings the most utility to me, I will forego the, cho the chance of having that wallet. Right? So that's how opportunity cost works. So the opportunity cost of producing one unit of textile for a developed country will be 3 out of 2 C. And in this case, C represents cars. So what this means is that if you want to make one more car, one more textile, you need to forego 3, three out of 2, 3.5 cars. Right? So this is the opportunity cost. The opportunity cost of producing textiles for the developed country is very high. Correct? And we look down, we look at the less developed countries. It's the opposite. The opportunity cost of producing one unit of textiles is actually two over three cars. So because of that, you realize that the less developed country is more suited in a sense, specialized in a sense, to produce textiles, whereas the developed country is more specialized to produce cars, correct? So if they were to go and sort of exploit their comparative advantage in this sense, and you look at this table over here, when they partially specialize with 75% of the resources in cars and 25% of the uh, in textile, this for uh, you know developed country and vice versa for uh, less developed countries. When they specialize, when they use, we play to their comparative advantage. What happens is that they will produce more. So this is the total production for developed countries and less developed countries, right? So because of that, the total production in the world will increase. You compare this to the front part, right? When you only we do specialize and there's no trade. Altogether, there are only 35 units of textiles and 40 units of cars. But when you do specialize and uh, using this opportunity cost ratio, you will realize that the, the total number total number of units of textiles and cars in the world will increase, right? And because of that, you realize that these, these countries are actually better off to do, right? So if let's say there is also trade um, on top of this, on top of this like specialization, what will happen is that both countries will get more than they used to have. Right, let's take a look. So if let's say we our terms of trade right now, TOT, is one textile, one unit of textile is to one unit of car. That means if let's say I'm a developed country, I say, okay, I have one car, I will trade it with you for one unit of textile. That's the terms of trade, right? If that happens and both countries trade to like, I, I guess equilibrium, right? What will happen is that the developed country will end up with 22 units of textiles, right? Which is two more than what they used to have. And 33 units of cars, which is three more than what they used to have. So you realize that this illustrates how um, with terms of trade, with trade, free trade, and uh, you know, playing to your comparative advantage and specialization, you realize that the entire world is better off to do. But how does this work, right? Remember when I said this only works, this only will be beneficial for both parties if the terms of trade lies within the opportunity cost ratios. So what this means is that if the terms of trade is not favorable for one side, so for instance, if let's say it's not one, it's not one textile to one car, but instead it's like maybe um, two cars to one textile. In that sense, if it's two cars to one textile, then it will not be beneficial to the developed countries, right? Because they need to give two units of cars in exchange of one unit of textile. Am I right? So if that's the case, then this ratio will be more than the opportunity cost for the developed country to produce the textiles themselves. Because think about it. If let's say the developed country wants to produce one unit extra of textile, they only have to um, you know, forego 1.5 units of cars. But if instead they want to specialize and then after that trade with a de less developed country, they'll need to forego two, unit of, two units of cars. So naturally they won't want to do that, right? I mean, who want to like pay more in a sense or like uh, be on the losing end of a trade, correct? So they will not specialize in that case. And this is what it means like, basically, what terms of trade means and how it relates to comparative advantage, right? Well, that was a, that was a mouthful. Um, you guys have any questions? Y'all can like ask at any point in time, by the way. Just unmute or send into the chat. Yeah, especially for my part just now, of course, I realized I didn't really explain properly. 
<laughs> no, no, no. You did, you did very well. I mean, um, you wanna, if you, if you want, we can go back to it if you have anything to add. Like, uh, no, it's not anything to add. It's just that, uh, <laughs> yeah, you all will probably have quite a bit of questions. I feel. No worries, no worries. If you guys have questions, just just send to the chat or like unmute. I think, I think you've got one question. Oh, legit? Yeah. Oh, let me see. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to open this. Oh no. Wait, I can't see it, sir. Uh, one sec. Ooh. Oh, what is it? Does trade terms of trade only apply to barter trade? Um. Okay. From what I understand, barter trade means like you you trade like one item for one item, right? Uh, I don't know what other types of trade there are, honestly. But I think they apply for any form of trade, honestly. Like I I would assume that trading in this. Um, in this case, trading would mean not just like good for good because I don't think that happens very often in the, in the real world today lah, unless there are like set FTAs or like contracts, contractual agreements between two countries. So I'll assume that um, this terms of trade concept will also, you know, um, I guess extend into like when you use money or like monetary transactions. So like, let's just say I have an agreement with someone. I'll say I'll always, for, for instance, like Singapore and Malaysia, like I would, I don't know if that's considered trade, but when we buy water from them and then we sell the water back to them, that's considered one of those kind of contractual agreements, right? So that could also, um, I mean, that definitely counts as comparative advantage because we have the technology and they have the resources. So we are both playing to our comparative advantages. But whether or not it is considered terms of trade is, uh, is I guess it's, um, I would say it's like a gray line. Lah. You can consider it that, but normally trade might sort of, um, I guess lean towards butter trade, but I don't think that will be very crucial in your un understanding of like TOT as well as CA. Um, nor would it be very essential in like answering questions like as long as you guys use the right concepts. I don't think they'll sort of ask you a question on whether or not you know terms of trade can apply for monetary transactions and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so I think I think so. Yeah, I'm not too sure if that answers your question, but um, yeah. Yes, no. <laughs> um, yeah, just let me know if you want more elaboration, okay? I'm just gonna move on real quick. Um, all right, so the next section is reviewing macro essay questions. Once again, these are questions that um, you guys have sent to us. Do know that we didn't include all of the questions because some of the questions, uh, first of all, they aren't very comprehensible. Um, I, I don't mean it. I don't mean in a sense of like, as in like the some some questions aren't like grammatically correct. So we just left them out because we didn't really understand what the question was asking for. Instead, next time when we have this kind of stuff or like after the lesson, if you guys still need clarifications, you can take a picture of the actual question and have to send it to us. I think sometimes when you're type, right, there might be like, um, you know, typo errors and stuff like that. And that makes it hard to comprehend. And also in the interest of time, like we didn't we didn't include as many. We just chose like, I think the most crucial ones, the most, um, well, the ones that are most likely to come out most useful to you guys are in our opinions. Yeah, so we have three questions. The first one is this. Let's take a look to, let's, let's take a minute to like read it, right? Read through. So this question is a 25 mark question. So what this means is first, like right off the bat, right? You must know that these are questions require quite a long evaluation paragraph. So that takes up about like five marks. Huh? I think not about five marks, exactly five marks. So 20 marks makes up the body of the, uh, like the contents, the content of the paragraph the paragraph, the answer, and five marks. The last five marks will be evaluation or synthesis. So like your conclusion, lah, basically. So you need to think about that when you're writing. So the question is, governments generally face trade-offs between different macroeconomic policy objectives. So um, here's the command word, discuss. Discuss how far a government's macroeconomic policy decisions when faced with these trade-offs are affected by the extent to which the economy is open. So, Quite a mouthful, I understand. Right off the bat, it's not something that most people would want to attempt. Lah. But that's also why we want to sort of like teach you guys how to approach this kind of, or unpack this kind of like very loaded questions, right? So let's, let's you know, the first thing we want to do, right, is definitely, when we read the questions, definitely need to like highlight the keywords, see what they're actually asking about. What kind of topics are you talking about, right? So right off the bat, um, macroeconomic policy objectives, once they already gave it to you, right? So it's definitely about macroeconomics. But what exactly about macroeconomics? That's the question, right? So here they say trade-offs. Trade-offs is a very important keyword. So trade-offs, um, I'm not sure, I'm not too sure what you guys understand by that, but I'll elaborate more about it later. Macroeconomic policy objectives. So these are talking about objectives, right? What the government wants to achieve. So this can you know range from um economic growth 
to low inflation, to low unemployment rates, any of the things that you can think of, even favorable balance of payments or balance of trade. So yeah, just once you read these kind of questions and keywords, right, I think it will be useful to, when you guys practice, it will be useful to like sort of um, recall what they're asking for. So objectives, then you're you know, in your head, you should go, okay, uh, it could be good economic growth, sustained economic growth, inclusive economic growth. Uh, it could be low inflation. Just keep thinking about this kind of stuff. And when you have exams, they will come in naturally. La. Yeah, right. Um, okay, so moving on, discuss how far a government's macroeconomic policy decisions when faced with these trade-offs are affected by the extent to which the economy is open. Right, so an important part of this question is whether or not the economy is open. That is basically your basis of comparison. That is the part that, um, I guess, is the hinge of the question, right? What this question is about is the openness of an economy. So this is why people don't really want to approach this question because it's sort of like, it packs two different um, topics into one. Openness of an economy, okay, let me go through the keywords, right? So it's easier for you to say. Okay, so first of all, the scope of the essay, right? You all need to know how the structure of a 25 mark essay goes, right? So this is the structure that we normally go with. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to follow this, but usually, like the rule of thumb is for 25 mark essay because there's a lot of marks in it, right? So you have to explain at least three different trade-offs. So in this case, um, why is it trade-offs? Because they ask for it, right? So they say, um, generally face trade-offs. So that's your subject, your topic. And then, um, so that, that, that's what you need to do, right? You need to explain three different types of trade-offs in your entire essay. But you don't do it in a sense, like you don't just explain. You must also sort of like bring in the, the thesis of the question, which is to discuss. Discuss what? Discuss how openness affects these trade-offs. So it's like, it's a very, um, the answer has to pack both things in, in a very like um, synthesized manner. So that's the problem with 25 mark essays. You know, some people are attracted to it because they think, okay, I only need to do one question. So I don't need to like change my mind between like a 10 mark and a 15 mark question. And what is correct, the reason why people normally don't do very well for 25 mark questions, at least from my experience, why I used to fail doing like those kind of big 25 mark questions is because I always thought, okay, I need to only write three content paragraphs. But then I'll forget, like for instance, I'll forget to write uh, three different trade-offs. I'll only focus on one. Then my scope will be very narrow and I'll only like land up with like maybe L1, L2, that kind of score. So what you need to do is when you write this kind of essays, before you write there, right, don't jump straight into it. Think about what's necessary first. So if you need to write three different trade-offs, what I would suggest, what the, you know, what we would suggest like, as, I guess, as a general guideline would be the first three paragraphs, I mean, all the body paragraphs, right? You need to talk about each one you talk about different trade off right? And we'll go in depth into it later. And instead of that, right, not just explaining the trade-offs, you need to add on, on top of that trade-off, how does openness affect? And you must also include both theses and anti theses huh? So what this means is that your thesis is your stand in, this, in a sense. Huh? It, is, um, it is basically your position on this argument. So for instance, uh, not argument, sorry, it is essay. So for instance, in this case, our thesis, right, I'm just gonna skip the thesis slide is that the openness of an economy will affect uh, the macroeconomic policy decisions to a large extent. So that's what we think. We think that um, openness, economic openness, right? Or like how, um, okay, how open an economy is will affect the macro policy decisions of, of government. So that's our stand. It can be different from ours, but make sure that you stick to this stand and make sure that you will have two paragraphs on this stand and one paragraph, um, you know, in the one paragraph talking about anti disease, right? Sorry, give me one second. I'll go back to the scope, right? And apart from this, this is just your twenty marks like content, right? You need also you also need to add in your synthesis, which is five marks. Synthesis is another word for conclusion or evaluation, you know, whatever you want to call it. But it's a lot of marks. Okay, five marks is a lot. You cannot expect. Okay, some people, at least myself, lah. Last time I used to like think. I like I used to think like this. I used to think, okay, I just need to nail the content. And just don't care about the synthesis, right? I just write one line. Maybe I'll get one out of five. But as long as I nail the content, I can still get 21 out of 25. And while this is true, theoretically, most of the time you realize that you don't get 20 out of 20 for your content, right? No matter how well you write. So the synthesis is always there for you to sort of like get your marks up a little bit. So don't underestimate it and make sure that you allocate enough time for it. Lah. That's my advice for you during um, econ's essay papers. Yeah, so paper one. Paper one? No, sorry, paper two. Right, so let's jump straight into the introduction, right? So. Introduction, normally people say, okay, I mean, I'm I'm a believer of this. Like, I don't think that it's greater in a sense, 
um, they don't really allocate marks to it, I feel, but it gives a very nice overview. So you want to you wanna make sure you ace this introduction. Um, unless you're really, really short on time, then I would suggest just skip straight to the content paragraph. But if you have time, make sure that you do this because not only does this help your examiner, like tell examiner that you know what's going on, but it also helps you sort of unpack the question, especially for those big questions, right? So you must first clarify the key terms. So what are key terms in this question itself, right? So the first one is microeconomic policy decisions. What is that? Um, it can come in any form. So this is very open, right? You can like talk about fiscal policies, monetary policies, or supply side policies, right? Anything, anything under the roof. And the um, second keyword is trade-offs. So trade-offs is not the same as limitations. Okay, there's a there's a distinction there. Trade-offs is like basically okay. Let me let me explain in layman layman terms. Lah. So a trade-off would be something like uh, if I have A, I will not be able to have B. Whereas limitation could be something like okay, because I have A. Okay, so for instance, like a limitation would be if let's say I want to use expansionary fiscal policy, then I will my limitation will be I need to have a budget, right? The government needs to have budget. If I want to like sort of uh, run a budget deficit, like, I need to make sure that I have enough money to do the transfer payments and lower taxes, right? So that will be what limitation is. But trade-off is, for instance, if I want to do EFP or expansionary fiscal policy, one of the trade-offs could be um it will conflict with, with another, another policy, for instance. So there's, there's a bit of a distinction there. It's like a short nuance, but at the same time, don't you worry too much about it. They weren't really like great your introduction. Lah. So you just want to write it down so that like you sort of like provide uh, an overview of what you're going to talk about and define everything that you want to want to talk about at the start lah, from the, from the get-go, right? So to the extent of which the economy is open. So what does an open economy mean? This is a question that perplexed uh, a lot of students, lah, including myself back when I was, um, studying so an open economy essentially just means that the economy is actively engaging in trade and not just any trade the more open it is right the larger the uh, x plus m not x minus m this time x plus m so x plus m is basically your total like um adding both your expenditure and your imports together to, to show how much sort of like how many how much transactions and like you know um interactions market interactions goes on on like a yearly basis, for instance. So if my economy is very open, like for instance, Singapore's economy is pretty open, right? Then I'll expect the X plus M to be very big and not just very big, it must also be a very large percentage of my GDP. Yeah. So for instance, Singapore's is like 300%. So that that's like, I think it's 300%, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but that means that our economy is very, very open. Lah. Yeah, right. So this is our thesis. I'll go through it one more time for those of y'all who weren't, um, really listening just now, <laughs> it's okay. So um, the thesis is that the openness of an economy will affect the government's macroeconomic policy decisions to a large extent. So that's the that's the thesis, you wanna write that down, okay? And you wanna write it down really big, very like very, very large, okay? Like write, write it like um, super, super big, so that like, and very neatly, so that in the exam, right? If let's say your examiner has no time or like it's in a bad mood, once they see the thesis, they know that you're answering the question. So that's good, right? So let's go to our body paragraphs. The first trade-off, the first trade-off is um, we chose, I mean, this, once again, this is just like a guideline, okay? It's not like a model answer by any sense. We're just trying to show you how it works. You can substitute this with uh, any other trade-off you can think of. But the first one that comes to mind for us is economic growth versus low unemployment or, uh, sorry, economic growth or low unemployment versus inflation, right? So this is like a, it's like a perennial, um, like conflict like, between two different objectives. So here's how we'll explain it, right? During recessions, governments employ EFP, expansionary fiscal policy, and this causes an increase in AD. So between these two, between these two, there's a link, right? You need to write down like how expansionary fiscal policy will increase AD. La. We just uh, didn't include it because uh, to make it concise and neat for you guys to see. So this will be like your usual stuff, you know, like how um, increasing like, the fiscal, fiscal policy, you must give an example. La. So for instance, like if let's say I want to talk about raising taxes, oh, sorry, not raising, reducing taxes and increasing transfer payments. What this does is this will increase G, government expenditure, and this will also increase consumption as well as investment, right? So this is what you need to write, and then that causes an increase in AD. So there's a, there's a link there that you guys need to write down. And with an increase in AD, the real national income, RNY, will increase. And because of that, your um, AD will rise again. And this is uh, uh, by multiply effect or so lah. You, you guys want to try to like write down the K process. So this highlighted one, right, is a multiplier process. So we'll, we'll go through like, a, I guess like a model kind of 
um, way to explain the multiplier process. But in this case, if let's say you have no time, right, you don't need to add in a lot of examples. I just need to like, you know, mention it as well as like explain it uh, a little bit, right? So then because of this, the economy will come closer to uh, full employment, YF, which is seen here in the graph. As you can see here, you'll move closer towards that. And thus, unemployment will fall as well as economic, sustained economic growth lah, will increase. So this is achieving one uh, macroeconomic goal or objective of the government. So this is just one part, right? Now, we can't just only talk about achieving one. There won't be a trade-off, right? We need to talk about how these two sort of conflict with each other, right? So from then, you can sort of like link it to this. So because of economic growth and because it's moving closer to full employment, the firms will compete with um, each other more fiercely for scarce resources, right? And because of that, as you can see from the graph as well, the increase in, I mean, the left, the rightward shift from 81 to 82 will cause the price level or GPL, general price level, to rise from P1 to P2, right? So that must be included in your answer as well. Right? You need to quote the values from the graph as well. And that makes it very nice and neat for the examiners to see, right? So because of that, the unique cost of production of firms will increase. And this is also passed on to the consumers, right? Depending on what kind of good luck, but I don't need to explain that. And because of that, your general price level will also rise and this will come in the form of demand pool inflation. So you guys um, know like the different types of inflation, right? Cost push, demand pool. So in this case, it's demand pool because AD increases causing the inflation. So demand pool, right? Demand pool, right? So this is how, this is your conflict. And this is like how you should explain it like, in a sense. So you must say, okay, then afterwards, I think, you know, it'd be nice to sort of like wrap it up a bit and say, right, so uh, if we use a policy, EFP, expansionary fiscal policy, and we bring about economic growth and low unemployment, right, this will inevitably cause a rise in inflation. So this is the trade-off, this is the conflict, right? So how does not, now you need to add, in, right? So this is basically explaining the first part, like how the conflict works and what trade-offs there are. But next part is where you answer the question. This is not sufficient. If you just write this, right, you get L1 or maybe low L2. But to actually nail that score, right, you need to bring in what the topic, the question is asking about, which is how the openness of an economy actually affects the, the trade-off, like affects um, the impact of this trade-off, right? So if I have an open economy, if my economy is open, that means I have a lot of like outside interactions with the international economy, right? If let's say I have a lot of exports and imports coming in and out, this results, this usually results in high leakages. What's leakages? So if let's say my, com my company, my um, country has like maybe like, I don't know, a GDP of like 100, 100 million or something, right? So if let's say I'm not open at all, right? This will stay in my, stay in my economy. So it won't go out and it will come in. There's no export or imports, right? But if I'm super open, right, then I will have a I'll have a high tendency to have a larger leakage, a larger ex import expenditure, for instance, right? So because of that, um, naturally, if let's say I spend more on imports, right, because of my economy is so open and I'm able to, you know, um, trade more with like different other countries, right? Because of that then my magnitude of K, which is the multiplier, magnitude of size of multiplier will be smaller because what is multiplier again? If you guys don't recall, multiplier is, um, is based on MPC, marginal propensity to consume, right? So we'll go through that later, but essentially if let's say your economy is more open and it's more likely to have exports and imports, right? Higher exports and imports and expenditure. And that that sum of money taking up a larger, sub, larger proportion of your GDP, that way, your magnitude of the multiplier will be smaller. And because of that, um, the governments will have to spend more money, right? Increase the you know, amount of G, government expenditure, to achieve your desired desire increase in whatever you want to do. Lah. So for instance, if let's say my goal is to increase economic, or like cause economic growth, spur economic growth, like sustain economic growth, or reduce unemployment, that way the government has to pump in more money if my economy is more open. So that is how it affects this trade-off, right? All right, so that's the first paragraph done. That's the first paragraph. And that's how you link both. So you see the green, the orange part is explaining the trade-off, right? And the green part is, um, the, the orange part is explaining, the, sorry, my, my train of thought just went off. The orange part is explaining the um, conflict, the trade-off, whereas the green part is actually answering the question, bringing in the openness of economy. So this, this format will follow throughout the rest of the explanation, all right? So, the second trade-off is economic growth versus a favorable balance of payment positions or BOP position or BOT, whatever you all want to write. Um, to be honest, in this case, it's pretty 
interchangeable because um, BOP is directly affected by change in BOT, right? As we have mentioned previously, right? So this is the explanation. During economic recessions, governments might ex employ expansionary monetary policy. So it's always good to vary your policies, right? You don't want to keep writing the same thing. You want to write expansionary fiscal policies for both paragraphs, even though technically it might be allowed, but a variety increases your scope. And this also shows the that you know your stuff. So as much as possible, try to flaunt that content knowledge that you have. I right? try to make sure that you can employ different types of policies at different stages. And that way you'll show that you know your stuff. Lah. And the, the, I mean like, you know, the government, the examiner would know that you know your stuff and they'll be like more inclined to give you marks. I think it's a psychological thing, um, but it's a good habit to have, right? So with expansionary monetary policy, there'll be a reduction in interest rate, right? And this will cause the cost of credit to drop. What's cost of credit again? Cost of credit is how much it costs to borrow basically, right? So firms and households will become more willing and uh, they'll borrow more, right? And they'll be more willing and able to invest as well as consume. So this boosts INC, which directly causes the aggregate demand to rise. And this also directly causes the real national income to rise, right? So because of this, purchasing power will increase and thus demand for imports will increase, right? So if you have more, especially for, okay, this, this is also like subjective and this is where the new ones comes in. Remember, remember, remember <laughs> sorry, remember this, okay? So um, I'm speaking too fast. Remember this. So for your evaluation, right, when you're writing your essay, when you think of like extra things that might like, spice your essay up. So for instance, when you talk about purchasing power increases, right, and how demand of imports will increase, this, you know that this is a subjective thing. It's not true for all open economies. It only, it's only true for economies that are um, open as well as, you know, have, has a general, generally has a high, has a high base income, like Singapore, for instance. Um, and also, it also depends highly on how they perceive the imports. So are imports considered as luxury goods or normal goods, right? So this increase in purchasing power and RNY directly affects, it's related to your YED, your income elasticity of demand. So if let's say the perception of these imports, right, um, is we, we perceive it as like, a, as like a normal good or like as luxury good, for instance, the more luxurious we consider it, the higher the rise in demand of exports due to the rise in purchasing power. So these are nuances that you must think about, scenarios and context. And why this is useful will come in handy later. So remember this, okay, remember this, and I will talk about it later. So this kind of stuff, when you're writing an essay, you're thinking, okay, this is subjective or this depends, right? Remember that, hold on to that thought and write it down somewhere because this is useful in your evaluation where you compare different scenarios and come up with a synthesized argument for your stand, right? So back to the question, back to the uh, second trade-off. Purchasing power increases and this causes the demand for imports to increase. Right. So because of that, your balance of trade and balance of payment worsens. Because if you in, if you want more imports and you pay, they're more willing and able to uh, purchase for imports, then the import expenditure will increase, right? And because of that, uh, X minus M will decrease because M increases, right? So balance of trade and thus balance of payment worsens, Saturday's paribus, and this causes us to have a conflict because having a favorable, a favorable BOP position is one of the macroeconomic objectives of governments, right? So because of that, there will be a direct conflict, right? So here's how it affects, here's how an open economy affects this trade-off, right? So when the economy is open or like there's a high propensity for consumers to sort of like spend, uh, uh, on, spend money on imports, right? Demand imports. So because the economy is open, um, import exponential over gross domestic product or M over GDP is greater. So what this means is that import expenditure takes up a larger proportion of your GDP, correct? That's intuitive, right? Because if it's more open, they can, you know, buy more stuff from outside, right? In the sense that in layman's terms. So because of this, if M over GDP is greater, then when R and Y and PP, R and Y is real national income, PP is purchasing power, by the way, when they rise, then import expenditure will increase to a greater extent. Right, because then I'll have more money to buy more. And that'll be, I mean, because it already covers such a big proportion of my GDP, it will even it will cause an even greater uh, tilt to my BOP, right? It will tilt like the um it'll make my balance of trade and balance of payment position less favorable, much less favorable. So the extent of openness directly affects how large this trade-off affects my com my um my com I keep saying company, my country, right? And so um, this is how you compare. Like, this is how openness affects your BOP and affects this trade-off. And I think uh, when you write that, you will have like a more 
I guess, rounder argument like, in a sense, right? Okay, so those are the two thesis paragraphs, your two um, trade off paragraphs in a sense. Now we're moving on to antithesis. And because of how, how like flexible this antithesis is, right? We didn't write down um, like the, the in depth explanation, but instead I'll explain to you guys why. Okay, so the antithesis can be any other factor because let's take a look at the question again. Discuss how far. A, which is this, a government's macroeconomic policy decisions is affected by the extent of which the economy is open. So because of that, you need to compare it with something else, right? You need to compare it with something else in your antithesis. So that can be, um, there must be another factor that might affect the government's macroeconomic policy decisions when faced with trade-offs. So this makes it very open and very easy for you guys to sort of um, decide what to talk about. Because there are so many different, and this is not an exhaustive list, by the way, we just like pluck some stuff out. Uh, you can talk about anything under the sun, as long as it affects, it can affect the government's macroeconomic policy. So this is basically uh, arranged in the order so that like, in our preference, uh, I think time lag and uh, state of economy is very easy to explain because time lag is just, oh, um, because, you know, the government, some, some policies require more time to become effective, right? Then because of that, then the government might be restricted or it might be limited by, uh, effectiveness of the policy will be limited by time, like instead of the openness of the economy. So you need to have that comparison, right? Something else might also affect the decisions, not just the openness of the economy. And that's why the antithesis exists. It provides a contrast and it's also very, very important. I used to think, you know, antithesis is not important. Like, as long as I talk about my stand, then it's okay. Already. But that's not true. And if you have the mindset, then it's very likely that if you meet a very bad examiner, right, they'll just, you know, cut your marks um, very badly. Lah. Yeah. Right, so if you guys want a more in-depth explanation or or rather if you guys want to like try this question out and see how you guys can write down antithesis, just you know feel free to do that and send it to us at any point in time. Like, we'll we'll go through and we'll like you know give our comments on it as well. Right. So that's antithesis for you. And now down to the last part, which is a synthesis and conclusion. One sec, someone's in the lobby. I see if I can let them in. Oh, okay, they're in. All right, great. So this is a synthesis and conclusion. This is what we're talking about for the whole, we've been talking about for the whole time, right? It's a five mark um, part and it's just one paragraph. So honestly speaking, some people feel it a lot and I used to feel it a lot as well because I feel like, okay, synthesis is like, you don't really know what's going on. You know, it's a hit or miss and it's true. Even now, I still consider it like quite hit or miss. Lah. Like there isn't really a set format to follow. Um, and often, oftentimes if you really follow a format, right, you don't really, you won't really get full marks for all the time, for all types of questions, right? you really need to freestyle sometimes. So this is an overview of how you want to do synthesis and conclusions most of the time, right? It depends on how much the, how much it weighs like, in a specific question as well. So for 25 mark questions, it's five marks. So you want to write more, you want to have like more volume in that last paragraph of yours, right? So the first part is you need to reiterate your thesis. And this is very important because it helps remind the examiner of your stand. And some people don't don't write that because they assume, okay, the examiner would know, but it helps them, like, it makes them happy. So just write it, it's just one sentence, right? The second part is explaining, um, okay, so this is a general approach you want to take for your conclusion, right? So after you reiterate your thesis, so for us is that uh, openness affects more than other factors, right? So you want to re-explain, okay, don't, don't repeat what you've said before. You want to compare. So instead of saying like, okay, um, Openness causes this, 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 which we've already said before. Instead, take this paragraph to compare between how much, how much openness affects the decisions of governments versus another factor. So for instance, time lengths, right? You want to compare them side by side. So that's basically what your evaluation is about, right? The first three paragraphs, your thesis, thesis, and antithesis, all three paragraphs are just explaining without comparison. Whereas your last paragraph takes everything together, puts them into one paragraph and compares these two factors coming to a conclusion, right? So that's what you want to do. And it sounds very, very broad and vague right now, but here's some easy methods of how you can sort of like create good elaboration and sort of like just, you know, wow the examiner. Lah. So the first type is, the, which is my favorite, is giving examples of scenarios. So this normally works when you're talking about like international trade questions, or for instance, when they give you a, they give you a place, like they say, uh, maybe in Singapore, blah, 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 right? So then you can sort of give examples, right, of like things that happen in Singapore. Give context, contextual evidence, right? So um, in this case, how you can do this is, for instance, just now we we're talking about it. Okay, so you see, remember this part in trade-off two? Purchasing power increases 
uh, causing the demand of imports to increase. And remember I said, I said that, okay, this is subjective, right? It depends on what kind of economy you are in. It depends on how much, uh, how you perceive these imports as a, like in general, how the economy perceives these imports. So you can bring that in, you can bring that in, you can say, okay, so um, given that, or like you can say something like, um, assuming that an open economy would have, for instance, um, a large M over GDP, a large proportion of import expenditure to GDP, because of that, uh, it's likely that, you know, blah, 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 and you can say that, like, but however, bring in some new ones, say that, okay, in this case, if let's say your imports is considered as a luxury good, which is most likely the case, like, because normally imports is more expensive than what you have in, in locally, right? Because like it, it comes with like a lot of transport costs, taxes and stuff like that. So usually it will be more, it will be perceived as luxury good. And because of that, an increase in income would cause a more than proportional increase in you know, then you talk about the YED and stuff like that. So bring in different concepts and different uh, scenarios, stuff that you've not mentioned before. Like, that's the main thing. You cannot repeat what you've said before. Okay, if not, you won't get many marks. You'll get like maybe like one out of five, two out of five, um, which is not ideal, right? So that's the most, that's the easiest way to do it. Give examples of scenarios, bring in context, right? One and C are pretty much related, right? So the second one, which is more difficult and it's quite specific, uh, it doesn't apply to us right now, but you can compare the impacts of each factor across time. So you can say like, okay, um, if we're talking about a short term, then this factor will be you know, more effective. If you're talking about long term, then perhaps this will be, but however, because we are, uh, with, uh, the context is set in the short term or like it's more important to consider the short term instead of the long term, uh, because in long term things vary more, that's why A is more important. So this is how I would compare it, but just take note that this B is very subjective. Like you can't really force fit in any, like every single scenario, which is why um, I don't suggest you guys memorizing conclusions. You need to synthesize it yourself on the spot. Uh, that way you'll be more successful, definitely. So, so yeah, this is basically a general guide of how you want to go through and go about doing your synthesis um, conclusion paragraph. Yeah. Okay, so that is the first question done. Um, it took a bit long, I think. So, so yeah, you have any questions? I think we will have like a Maybe we'll take like a two to three minute break. I'll put on the second question. And afterwards, um, if you have any like queries or like doubts that you want to clear, just, you know, just send it in. And yeah, we'll go through it. <laughs> okay, great. This is the second question and feel free to ask any questions. Okay, I'm going to go and get myself a cup of water. We'll be back in two minutes. You all can go and like have a toilet break and stuff like that too. <laughs> all right. Ooh. Hello. Do we need intro and evaluation for part A essay questions? All right. So um, to answer that question, thanks, thanks, Lisa, by the way, for the clarification. So yeah, so part A essay questions, by that I'll assume you mean the 10 mark questions, right? So um, okay, so how it's formatted is that those questions are usually, as you can see. Wait, I think there's a question three is a demo question. So normally the command word for that kind of question is like explain. So you can say explain how um, perhaps expansionary fiscal policy leads to blah, 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 right? So when that happens, right, normally the emphasis on introduction and evaluation is much lower and it's split up into eight and two usually. So what that means is that your 10 marks, right? Eight marks is your content, two marks is your evaluation or conclusion. So in, this, in those cases, right, especially if the entire question doesn't have much, many like keywords that you are not familiar with or like you think needs clarification, normally what I'll do is I'll just like go straight into my thesis if I have no time, right? So just go to in, in your thesis and clarify whatever keywords that, uh, that you, you deem necessary. Lah. And um, on top of that, you know, your conclusion should 
be there, definitely, because there are two marks allocated to it. But you don't have to give an in-depth analysis. You want to just like, you know, kai kuo, um, which is, what, what is that in English? Basically gloss over it, right? Gloss over the conclusion and like give an overview. So like you want to reiterate your thesis, definitely. And also a short elaboration will do. Lah. Not too long. Maybe keep it to three or four sentences maximum. I think that will do the job. Yeah. Usually those can get you like maybe like 10 marks already. Uh. Yeah, it'll get you full marks because uh, it's only two marks, right? So that's a basic, you know, rule of thumb when it comes to writing, answering 10 mark uh, essay questions. Yep. All right, question two. Hope you guys had a good break. So this question is a 15 mark question. It's um, one of those part B essay questions. Uh. So uh, it goes, it's, it's simpler, you know, it's simpler. It's more straightforward than the first question. We try to put the, the harder ones in front, but this one is more, this one is simpler. It's quite standard actually. So discuss whether the size of multiplier, which is one, one factor, is the important, is the most important factor in determining the effectiveness of expansionary fiscal policy on an economy, right? So right off the bat, when you're serious, right, you all need to think of what? Think of, okay, expansionary fiscal policy is a limitation of the question. So you can only talk about EFP, right? That's first of all. Second of all, you need to think, okay, what other factors affect the effectiveness of EFP? That's what you need to discuss about, right? That's your second part of your question. So the first question is, first part is the size of multiplier. So how would you go about dissecting this question? So first of all, in the introduction, you want to clarify your keywords, right? So how do you do that? What's the keywords? Honestly, from here, you know, you don't really need to explain multiplier yet because that will be part of your content paragraph. So instead of that, um, perhaps, you know, it'll be good to explain uh, what, you know, expansionary fiscal policy means. But this is completely unnecessary, like, honestly. Um, not say completely unnecessary. If you guys have no time, don't need to explain it. But it'll be nice to define it because like, as you guys know, uh, fiscal policy is like, it's very ambiguous. There are different ways to define it. There's a broad way and there's a narrow way. You want to try to like pin that down as soon as you can. Yeah, so this is optional. You don't have to write it in your introduction. You can just write a thesis, but at the same time, it makes it seem like fuller. So I would suggest putting it in introduction instead of writing in your content paragraph. Lah. Yeah, so especially because fiscal, especially fiscal policy, especially fiscal policy. Okay, no, sorry. Correction, uh, remove the expansionary, just fiscal policies, right? Because I didn't talk about expansionary in the definition, right? So fiscal policies are policies that aim to influence overall economic activity by altering the level of aggregate demand. So it's basically policies that affect AD. La. That's the textbook definition um, that you guys memorize, right? So yeah, that's basically it. And in, including, I mean, on top of that, you guys need to talk about thesis as well, la, right? So thesis is basically, because it's discussed, you only need to think about it. So either, um, either you think that it's the most important factor or you don't think it is. You think there's another important factor. So you say that, um, uh, you know, this essay believes that, or I believe that, you know, the size of multiplier is not the most important factor, or there are other factors that are more important, for instance. Right. So the first body paragraph um, is, we would suggest for you to use it to explain the multiplier effect, because that's the basis, right? That's the first factor you want to explain. So just to recap, multiplier or K is one over one minus MPC. So this is your arithmetic progression. Um, one over one minus arithmetic progression. No, sorry. Geometric progression, my bad. Uh, but yeah, so basically um, one, what's MPC? MPC is uh, marginal propensity to consume. So that's like your, it's basically how likely or like, yeah, how like the tendency for, uh, for an economy to like sort of um, use additional income to uh, consume. All right, so this is also equivalent to one over MPW, which is the propensity, marginal propensity to withdraw. So when you explain multiplier effect, which is something you guys might have done a lot of times already, uh, it'll be very useful to use it, use examples to illustrate it. So here's what we mean. Remember when I said that there's a model answer in a sense? So this is what we would sort of give like, like as a brief overview, right? So when AD or real national income increases, then the purchasing power of households will increase, and then thus the induced consumption will increase. So induced consumption is basically consumption that's caused by an increase in income, right? And you must write down here, like as an example, you should try to give numbers, la, numerical examples. So by a factor of whatever, whatever, whatever. whatever. So like MPC, perhaps like um, you can just give a random number, la, uh, 0 0.6 is something that I used to go with a lot of times. And then you can say that, okay, Withdrawals will increase as more households will save, spend on imports, and then you know the government will earn more on income tax. However, 
the um, this induced consumption will keep going in cycles, right? It will just keep going, and every round, the rise of national income will get smaller and smaller because MPC is never going to be one. So it will always decrease, right? Every round will decrease until it becomes negligible. And thus, the eventual rise in RNY or real national income is given by the product of, and this is basically defining what multiplier is. La. It's basically this, one second, basically this formula over here, but you just write it out in words, right? So the size of multiplier constant is one over marginal propensity to withdraw, MPW. Or you can write one over one minus MPC, la, same thing. Yeah. So this is how you would really ideally explain multiplier effect, but this also depends on whether or not you have time. So if you have a lot of time, try to give a more robust sort of explanation with a lot of elaborations and use numbers if possible. Yeah. So your second paragraph, or you can combine this with your first paragraph if you want to, but this will be neater if you split it into two, will be how the size of multiplier would affect effectiveness of your expansionary fiscal policy. So this is your first factor, and it's a factor that your question is asking you about, right? So how would the size of M, M size of K, affect effectiveness of EFP? So um, first of all, you want to sort of give a brief explanation of how expansionary fiscal policies work, because that way you can ease into, into like the discussion quicker. La. And it's, it's, I mean, it's definitely necessary la, in this case, because your subject is only EFP. So you want to explain it first. So how does it work? So for instance, if I want to say lowering taxes as an EFP, I want to lower taxes and increase the uh, amount of transfers. What this will result in is an increase in government spending, G, and also uh, investment and consumption directly, because then uh, you know people have more uh, money to spend, uh, more willingness and ability to invest as well as consume. And thus, this will lead to an increase in aggregate demand, right? So just a very brief explanation will do. Try to, you know, like don't, don't make it too short, but at the same time, you don't have to like dwell on it too much, right? Because the main point of this entire essay is not exactly to explain EFP, but more of how multiplier affects EFP, right? So it's essential to explain it, but don't dwell on it too much. You don't want to write like a half and half a page, half a page on it, you know? Um, so yeah, that's not necessary. Right. So the second part of this paragraph will be explaining how the multiplier affects EFP. So this should be the bulk of your essay not essay, your paragraph, right? So how um, a larger multiplier will result in, for instance, the initial injection being um, inducing a large rise in income due to in the induced consumption. Sorry, that's the typo over here. Large rise in income due to, large, sorry, large rise in income induced consumption. My bad, there's no typo, sorry. Don't know what I'm thinking. All right, so basically what this means is that because the multiplier is large, for instance, if you have a larger multiplier, the initial injection will be multiplied by a, uh, a factor of a larger factor, right? So for instance, if let's say my um K is, is two, uh then that way, compared to like if my K is 1.5, the initial injection G will cause a larger increase in AD overall, right? Because then the induced consumption will, will be will be higher every round. So so yeah, so that's how multiplier affects EFP and how it can make it more effective, basically. So you want to explain that in detail. We're just writing this as like a you know, like a overview. La. Right, so the third paragraph, your third body paragraph, will be discussing another factor that affects the effectiveness of EFP. So this is use, this is essential because it provides a basis of comparison, right? So if you if you may, you can, I mean, if you want to, you can choose any of the following. So there are different, a lot of factors, as you guys probably know, a lot of factors that affect the effectiveness, effectiveness of um, expansionary fiscal policy. So the first one is your proportion of government spending over GDP. So for instance, if let's say you have a lot of, uh, I mean, your, your government spending, like for instance, if you, if you inject like 10 million, but then your GDP is like uh, 200 billion or something. So it's very minuscule compared to your entire GDP and thus it will not be as effective, right? Um, you can talk about time lags. So that's how long this entire insertion, like this initial injection would actually cause a positive effect. You can talk about tax insensitivity, which is when people, be, uh, because of like positive or negative, um, you know, in this case, expansionary. So because of uh, negative, you know, uh, economic sentiments, and low consumer as well as producer confidence, then they will be insensitive to lowering taxes because they will think, okay, you know, like I, I still don't want to still want to spend more, um, and it will be much more ineffective, lah. So choose any one of these factors, right, and write about it. Explain like how you would explain in the previous paragraph, and that will be your third body paragraph, right? So on top of that, because it's a fifteen mark question, 
you realize that there's also a part allocated to conclusion and synthesis. And thus, you need to use the same model as I explained previously. So um, you want to sort of use this entire paragraph to compare these two factors, right? So first, you want to reiterate your stand. You want to say, okay, for instance, if let's say I, I, I'm for the stand that, you know, multiplier is the most, makes the most impact on the effectiveness of EFP, then I'll say, I'll say just that. And then the second part will be explaining the stand further by providing, once again, context, right? In this case, you can use, um, if let's say you're talking about time lags, right? Um, then you can use comparison over time, right? You can see, you can just compare the two directly and say that, okay, so uh, because usually EFPs take more um, time to enact and stuff like that. And that's why I feel like, you know, the immediate effect of size of multiplier would not directly, uh, would not be so, would not impact the uh, effectiveness of EFP too much. Instead, the time lags might be even more detrimental to the effectiveness of, um, you know, your expansionary fiscal policy. That's an example, perhaps. And then afterwards, you want to try to add in some nuances, now, as I've explained previously. So if you, while writing, usually the good practice is while writing your body paragraphs, right, you want to start thinking about what you write for the conclusion. So first of all, right off the bat, you know what, it, what your stand is. But instead, um, instead of just like waiting to the end, you want to try to like sort of form an idea of what um, you want to write about. Like. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's basically it. And once again, you know, this kind of stuff, conclusion and synthesis is very subjective and it really depends on what you write on the day itself. So what we would suggest you guys do, right, is um, whenever you have time, even when you're writing just an essay plan, right, you want to try your best to write down the conclusion and synthesis. Just try to use like, you know, maybe if you want to write a point for most of can, write down the ideas of what you would write. And then, then afterwards, there'll be, you, you collate that experience, like, you'll gain experience. And on the day itself, when you're taking A-levels or whatever exams, prelims, uh, for instance, then you you come to you more naturally. So with regards to this, if you guys want to try it out, along with like the entire essay actually, if you want to try it out, write it out in full or in point form, just do that and have to send it to us. We'll send you guys the slides after this uh, webinar. But yeah, just feel free to you know text us or just type into the Discord channel if you want us to mark your work. Yeah, right. So the last question, question three. I'm gonna pass the time back to Zach. He'll go through this question. And yeah, any questions, just type in the chat, okay? Thank you very much, guys. Okay. Hi, I'm back. Okay, uh, basically, very fast game. Uh, exp explanation questions, uh, what I like to call it is uh, control vomiting. Because um, it's basically a lot of content, but you need to know what content to write, what content not to write. Okay, uh, number one, inclusive and sustainable growth, confirm plus chop will come up for some exam. I don't know whether your schools have really tested or not, but uh, given the issue, I think they probably just tested it. Uh, inclusive and sustainable growth, they love to test this, either as a 10 mark or 15 mark or even 25 mark. So you all really need to know this quite well. Whether it comes out in A levels or not, uh, I don't know, but across the board, your inclusive and sustainable growth questions are actually quite easy to answer once you've got the hang of it. Okay, so basically you see the two words I highlighted, like inclusive and sustainable growth. So first step to answering the question is uh, understanding and knowing what the heck is your inclusive and sustainable growth. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so Number one, your, your inclusive growth and your sustainable growth. Uh, basically, both of them will contain sustained growth in the definition. Uh, if you all read your school notes, very sure that every single uh, definition of inclusive and sustainable growth will include sustained growth in the definition. So what's the difference between the two? Number one, your inclusive growth is uh, your sustained growth and also the fact that you're taking into account that uh, taking into account that the income distribution is uh, distributed equally and uh, it doesn't worsen your income gap or income inequality inside the economy. So what this means is that you will have your AG, your actual or real economic growth, your potential economic growth, plus you must make sure that whatever policy that you implement will not cause your income gap to widen or result in any loss of uh, SOL for any certain group of people in your economy. Next, you look at sustainable growth. This one, very easy also. 
sustain growth. You really know what that is. Uh. I won't reiterate myself. So what sustainable growth is, is that you have your sustained growth and also you make sure that you uh, secure, secure what I call green goals, uh, okay? uh, lowering your carbon footprint or uh, like switching to cleaner and very cleaner sources of energy or even uh, very simply like let's say your country is running low on like uh, resources to uh, make textiles. So your government implements some policy to uh, lower, to switch over the use of textiles to other materials to produce your goods, that sort of thing. So those are what you call uh, policies to uh, help the country achieve sustainable growth. Basically, you see uh, what, what I wrote here. Rapid, uh, without rapidly depleting resources means that you make sure that you don't use too much now so that next time you got more in layman terms. Uh. So when you, cut, when you see these kind of questions, always make sure that you look at the type of growth and you make sure that you clearly know what growth they are talking about before you attend the question. This is very important because a lot of people, when they sit for a paper, they have no idea what the heck growth they are talking about. Okay, next slide. Now you look back at the question, you see that they're asking you how the fiscal policies can result in inclusive and sustainable growth. So before you start your paragraphs, uh, you think about what sort of fiscal policies that you have. Lah. So the very basic one everyone will immediately think about is uh, directly increasing your government expenditure. And then uh, so on and so forth, you have Right, uh, raising or lowering your taxes, or like, uh, those are uh, the the first two are basically your discretionary fiscal policies, and then the last three are basically your uh, what the teachers had to call auto stabilizers, uh, your non discretionary fiscal policies. So your progressive tax, your financial assistance programs like your FAS, uh, and your unemployment benefits. A uh, point to note is that Singapore doesn't actually have unemployment benefits. Uh, most of the time when you talk about unemployment benefits, you talk about US and other countries. Uh, uh, so you see you have all these different policies that are categorized under your fiscal policies, right? What you want to do is to look at this as your toolbox. Basically, when you see policy questions, right? Think about what you have under this categorization of policies. Then you, from what you know about uh, what policies are available for you to use. Take them out and then uh, write about it. So, okay, we'll move on first, then it will give you a clearer picture. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so you write your first paragraph. Uh, as I said just now, right, when you look at the definition of inclusive and sustainable growth, both of them include attaining uh, your sustained growth. So what I like to do when I see these kind of questions, right, especially for inclusive and uh, sustainable growth, is to firstly uh, nail down your, how your fiscal policy will result in sustained growth. Otherwise, without your sustained growth, you can't have inclusive, you can't have sustainable growth. Okay, so as you can see, I put at the side down there, beside para one, example, G rise for infrastructure. This is something that a lot of people like to use, uh, basic, uh, for me, uh, at least for me, I like to use this example a lot. Uh, Basically, what it means that what, what it means is that the government will increase it in its expenditure for uh, building infrastructure. So now we're talking about sustained growth. We base very simply you go through your uh, K process. I uh, write out very, most preferably to write out the entire K process, like what each Hung showed you all just now. That was uh, actually my paragraph that I did as correction last time. Yeah, uh, basically, okay, uh, tip, uh, if you want to know how to write a good K paragraph, uh, like multiply process paragraph, right, just write one, ask your teacher to mark, whatever the whatever comments the teacher gives you all, then uh, correct it, then you rewrite on a new clean piece of paper, you submit back to your teacher to mark, and see whether there's any difference. At least that's how I did it. Uh. Okay, so uh, going back to what I wrote here, your increase in G will lead to a rise in AD. Then through your multiplier process, your real national income will rise. Then this will give you your real economic growth. Or for some schools, they'll call it actual economic growth. Uh. 
Now, uh, just attaining real economic growth will not give you your sustained growth. So, what you need to explain further is your SRAS and your LRAS movements. So, in the short run, due to the improvement in infrastructure, for example, you build more roads, you improve your transport networks. This will give your workers and your uh, goods greater factor mobility. Basically, uh, if you are if you are a laborer or you are an employee, you can move around faster. Or if let's say you're talking about goods, better transport networks will help your goods move from point to point faster. So for example, you have factory A that produces, let's say, your cloth, and factory B, which processes the cloth into let's say bags or something. So if you have better transport networks, your cloth can reach factory B from factory A faster. This will improve the efficiency of uh, your uh, production processes. So productivity will increase. And also because your because of uh, greater productivity, you have a lower unit cost of production because now you can produce more goods in a shorter time. So this will result in you attaining potential economic growth. Now in the long run, because of this uh, improvement in infrastructure, you can actually produce uh, basically the maximum capacity of goods in your economy that you can produce actually increases. So this will result in a uh, rightward shift of your LRAS. And then the part on uh, increase in productivity will actually result in a downward shift of your AS. So because of this, you actually attain your real economic growth and your potential economic growth. So this will give you sustained economic growth. OK, next slide, please. Yeah, OK, basically what you saw, just what you see in this diagram is basically how your uh, macro diagram will move, uh, your curve. See, from AS1 to AS2, the curve shifts right and then shifts down. And then your AD will increase from AD1 to AD2 because of your rise in G. OK, OK, next slide. Now, uh, we'll move on to how this will result in inclusive growth. So, as a, if you remember what was inside the multiplier process that Yichang showed you all, basically, uh, when your AD rises, there will be a increase in a derived demand for labor. And, be, and because of this increase in derived demand for labor, that's how you get your rise in household incomes. So now, because of the increase in direct demand for labor, this will put an upward pressure on the wages for, let's say, unskilled workers, very specifically your unskilled workers, because they need to hire more construction workers, which are considered unskilled laborers. So your unskilled laborers, their wages go up, and then satirist parables, your higher skilled laborers, their wages remain constant, this will actually pull the wage gap closer. So because your wage gap becomes smaller, your, there is lesser income disparity in your economy. And this is how you attain inclusive growth. This is just one of many ways you can approach your inclusive growth. Another way you can actually approach this is actually to do with SOL. So for example, uh, I think one of the questions I've done before is that uh, SOL for people living in like lower income households, basically for, okay, uh, without giving you an example, uh, just like a generalized, a general answer. Sometimes when you talk about SOL, you talk about one party's SOL falling, one party's SOL rising, or vice versa. So that will uh, either result in a greater income disparity, a greater disparity because a uh, greater income disparity because of the difference in opportunities given to uh, the people in your economy. Yeah. So if you look at inclusive growth, it's basically talking about uh, providing equal opportunities in terms of the SOL or your wages. Yes, correct. OK, next question. Uh, next part. Okay, now you talk about sustainable growth. Like I said just now, sustainable growth, 
fast game, you see sustainable, you call either your carbon tax or your green subsidies. But because you're talking about fiscal policies and you need to attain your sustained growth, it's actually very hard for you to talk about taxes because taxes will actually cause uh, will result in unintended outcomes by lowering your real economic growth. Yes. Okay, so now we talk about uh, if at the, at the start we talked about increasing G on infrastructure, but at the start we talked about infrastructure such as transport networks. Now to fit your answer, manipulate your answer a bit so that the teacher will think that you know your stuff. You say that uh, at the start you only mention generally uh, G spending on infrastructure. Now you play punk with the teacher and then you write increase G on infrastructure such as uh, to make cleaner sources of energy such as new power plants, your nuclear power plants, your solar power and your wind power, all those stuff, those are considered cleaner sources of energy and you need to build new infrastructure to accommodate space and uh, resources to facilitate the use of this kind of energy. So what happens when you produce, when you build this kind of infrastructure is that you reduce the carbon usage for firms because you burn less coal by substituting the coal with power from your wind and the sun. So because you use less coal, you slow down the depletion of your non-renewable resources like your carbon and coal, basically your fuel and stuff, you know, the, the things that the Americans like. So this helps you to ensure that while you have sustained economic growth, you can also make sure that you don't mess around with the universe and cause even greater global warming. Ah. Yes. And because you use less of this carbon, you reserve all these carbon pools for your future generations to use. Just in case somewhere down the road or like 100 years later, they still haven't found a substitute for like carbon or for fuel. Lah. Then uh, you make sure that your children still got energy and still got fire to burn. Lah. Yeah. So that's a very general idea of how you answer sustainable growth questions. Of course, you listen to me talk, it sounds uh, very, uh, how do you say, lackadaisical, like very free like they are. But when you write your answers, right, try to include like diagrams and stuff. Yeah, include diagrams and make sure that your explanations actually make sense. Most of the time when you write stuff in your essay and they make sense to you, and when you explain it to your teacher in class and the teacher accepts it, you should be able to write in your essay for exams. So every time you're not sure about whether what you wrote for your practice is correct or not, always make sure you clarify for your teacher. That's very important. Even if your teacher calls you stupid, uh, my teacher flame me like every week in class. Uh, so don't, don't be shy to ask your teacher, like it's serious. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, the last part is uh, basically your mini evaluation. Uh, like the question that uh, Yichang had just now. Uh, what was it? Yeah, do we need an intro and evaluation for part A essay question? So this question is a 10 mark question, right? Uh, for me, right, I generally like to have a sweet conclusion to every single essay I do. Uh, probably that's why I like to write full stops at the end of all my texts. Uh. Uh, so, like you see what I wrote here, okay, it's quite impossible for you to attain inclusive and sustainable growth at the same time. Most of the time for part A questions, right, the conclusion doesn't have to be very related to your, to what the question is asking for, but you just write it there so that it looks, your answer looks more complete. That is provided you got time and you are damn confident that you can finish the rest of the questions properly. So if you are legit running out of time, right, I suggest just write the, all the explanation paragraphs and then screw the conclusion. 
just move on to the next question. Yes, that, that, that is what I would recommend you to do. Yes. Also, whenever you see, like, sometimes they give uh, part B questions, especially for inclusive and sustainable growth. This mini evaluation that I wrote here, right, is uh, particularly useful because it's, uh, it's almost true all the time. Lah. So, uh, and the more papers you do, the more you realize that uh, a lot of the things that you write can be recycled and reused in every single question you do. Yeah, that's all for question three. Thank you. Uh, any questions you all can ask now also? Q&A time. Thank you so much, Zach. That was damn funny. Yeah. I was like laughing my, laughing my butt off over here. Wait, sorry. I I just think we need to, I mean, I think we need to um clarify Hello's question. Hello asked, do we need intro and evaluation for part A essay, right? My bad. I just want to check. Um, I, I'm kind of like out of touch with like the, the, the syllabus and stuff like that. Lah. So basically, um, I confused the essay with CSQ. So for essay questions, right, you don't need to have an evaluation to score full marks, not necessarily. But as Zach says, you know, it's very, always very good to like cap it off with like one or two sentences and stuff. So it's not necessary. You don't get marks for it. You can still very well get like full marks, um, you know, without a conclusion or an introduction. But our suggestion is just to write a few uh, sentences and stuff. But for CSQ, however, two marks are allocated to the conclusion, right? As you know, uh, for both essays. So in that case, it's necessary for you to write a mini evaluation or conclusion. Yeah. So that's just to clarify the question. Like I answered it wrongly. That's my bad. But yeah. Any questions? Any other questions you all have? You know, regarding this lecture or anything in general, you know, feel free to ask us. Just unmute your mics if you want, you know. Hey, Rachi, I got any questions, please ask. Uh. I know the explanation isn't very, very thorough. Mm. Do you need to state your stand right from the start? Um, generally, yes, I would suggest we you do. Just yeah. like write down in your thesis. Lah. Yeah. But if you, like, let's say you know time, right? Like what you should say just now for intro, right? You got no time. Uh, scrap all the definitions and stuff, just write your stand right at the start, then go into your content. Really. At least when you write your stand, then they will give you one mark because they actually answer the question. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Yo. Sorry, I can't see here. Do you suggest writing evaluation comments in the body paragraph or just evaluation? Right, so this is based on pers personal preference. For me, for my school, what we learn is we write the evaluation in the last paragraph because I think that makes it much clearer. And it's like the structure is nicer for examiners to mark as well. Then if you want to create your evaluation, you can just go all the way to the back. I'm not too sure about Zach. Like, what, what were your practices? Yeah, okay. Uh, basically, right, in JC, my teacher was a super practical exam teacher. So basically, Whatever you really learn, right, is legit for your exam and the best for your exam. So she, what she said was the most optimal method is that every, after every single point you write, at least for essays that require evaluations, you finish your point and you write a small paragraph of evaluation. So it's basically thesis, antithesis, thesis, antithesis. And, the, and then at the end, you write a complete synthesis of the of your essay because what she said is that regardless of whatever antithesis you write there will always be something for you to synthesize at the end yeah true, 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 that's true. how i that's how i did my papers uh. guys um before you leave you know really quickly please uh help us with uh with the um, Google form, like the feedback form, so that we can improve our uh, webinars for you guys, make it nicer. Because this time around, the attendance wasn't as good as we expected it to be. La. So we want to find out why also. And yeah, just let us know, you know, be as honest as you want. Yeah, the form link is in the chat. 
group, the chat group, no, the chat, yeah. So just like make sure you're, like, it's just like, you know, two minutes. Uh. So just, if y'all can help us fill it up, please. Thank you. It's like liquidity trap, uh. okay. <laughs> uh, so when you are calculating your real interest rate, right? Yeah, real interest rate or something, right? Yeah. So what happens is that uh, you have to calculate uh, your current, your nominal interest rate, and then uh, minus your uh, inflation rate. So kind of like how you calculate your real GDP. So uh, when the country is doing uh, expansionary, yeah, expansionary monetary policy to boost their economic growth, what happens is that some of them like to reduce their nominal interest rate all the way down to zero. But at the same time, the country might have a negative inflation rate. So uh, inevitably, you get a positive real interest rate. Lah. Then uh, you actually get the opposite reaction of what you want. Yeah, to add on, I think... Trip. Yeah, to end on, I think liquidity trap is basically, okay, it's one of the toughest concepts to understand, but in essence, all you know is just, it's just a contradiction between what you, what the, uh, like, what your policy is trying to achieve and what actually happens. Uh. So when the policy, when the, you know, interest rate goes down to super low, um, that coupled with, you know, uh, either low inflation or like, like near to zero or like negative inflation too, right, like deflation, uh, um, as well as like high savings rates, that's quite important also. Like when your savings, like those bank saving rates are very high, right? Then you it will basically do the exact opposite. So if your saving rate becomes higher than your your interest rate, right? Then uh, nobody want to hold assets anymore. You know what I mean? They just want to put it in the bank and save it. So basically, that's what happens uh, if um there's and like they overly reduce the interest rate. So that's basically what liquidity trap is. Um, but at the same time, you don't have to. They won't test you directly on it. Right, at least we have not seen questions on it, but you can use it in your uh, explanation or evaluation if you want to. Yep, 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 yep. 